on March 16, 1968, in the middle of the Vietnam War, in the village of My Lai, the American soldiers of the Charlie Company execute 504 civilians, including women, children, and old people. The My Lai Massacre was covered up by the Army and will remain a secret until November 1969. The press takes up the case. These photos are going all over the world. Public opinion is changing. It is a turning point in the Vietnam War. But how did this day mark those who were in My Lai on March 16, 1968? The Charlie Company was considered the best of the 11th Infantry Brigade. We were excellent in all our missions. We had no problem in being accompanied by reporters. We thought it was great to have some media coverage because we were the best. In his hometown, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Fred Widmer, a former member of the Charlie Company, comes back like every year to testify in front of Chartier's Valley students. In American high schools, the Vietnam War has an important place in history programs. I joined the Army voluntarily. I didn't really have an opinion on the Vietnam War. I just thought it was my duty to serve my country, just like my dad did. That's what I thought. That was the outlook I had. Larry Colburn lives in the Atlanta area. He did not belong to the Charlie Company. But on March 16, 1968, he was given a mission that also led him to my life. He's barely older than his son. My dad served for four years in England and France during the Second World War. And instilled in me subtly. He instilled in me the concept of duty, the obligation to serve one's country. I joined the army when I was 17. In the suburbs of Cleveland, Ohio, Ron Heberl, the official photographer of the Army, was also in my lie on March 16, 1968. When I was called in the Army, I did my military training. Then I was sent to this new unit that was being created in Hawaii. In the beginning, I had to be a mortar operator. I brought my camera and I took a lot of shots during training. They liked my photos, and they offered me to work in the Department of Information and Communication. And that's how I started my career in the Army as a photojournalist. American actions in Vietnam started timidly in 1955, shortly after the Indochina War. As a result of the Geneva Agreements, Vietnam was split in two. The North is controlled by communists led by Ho Chi Minh. In the south of a demarcation line, local government is led by the United States. Each camp seeks to reunify the country for its benefit. Under the leadership of the President Lyndon Johnson, the American military contingent in the South keep increasing. They went from 185,000 men in December 1965 to 390,000 men one year later. 
On the eve of the year 1968, nearly 470,000 American soldiers are stationed in Vietnam. On the ground, nothing is going as planned. In February 1968, the army was overtaken by the Tet Offensive. The Viet Cong are simultaneously attacking 100 cities. After fierce fighting, the American army manages to contain the offensive. But psychologically, nothing is going well anymore. American decline is on the rise, even if for soldiers, war is always considered an adventure. For me, the real starting point I think that the real starting point of my life, it's the training of the regiment in Hawaii. In Hawaii. Oh, you knew everyone. everyone knew each other. We had been together for nine months. The links that joined us were very strong. The bonds were even too strong because you can't be that close. This affects the morale of the troops. I thought that I would stay in I thought I was going to stay in Hawaii for 18 months, but I signed up to go to Vietnam. My friends were going there. I was part of their group, and I decided to go with them. I was thinking about the Second World War. I imagined that we were going to assault from a beach, as in Normandy. We had all our equipment. Our rifles were loaded. We arrived at the beach, the doors have opened, and there, soldiers were lying down on the beach in a swimsuit. They were sunbathing. Oh yeah, they laughed at us. And that's how it all started. When you become a soldier, and more especially in the infantry, they teach you how to follow orders and to kill. They strip you of your values and your personality, and make you integrate a group of identical individuals, who all have the same objective. Fred Widmer was involved in the infantry and was one of the operators in the Charlie Company radio. We were in trucks leaving from Quang Nai to Duc Phu alongside the 11th Brigade. I remember, I was sitting in the front with the driver. And I realized for the first time how we dehumanized the Vietnamese people. There was a Vietnamese man on a bike in front of us, on the road. The truck driver hit him on purpose and sent him into the ditch, and we kept going. He could have avoided him, but he didn't even try. He didn't even stop. He just hit him and kept going. And at that moment I asked myself what sort of a situation I've gotten myself into. Larry Colburn was working in aviation. He provided assistance from his helicopter to ground troops. Once you arrive in Vietnam, your mindset is starts to change. For example, you never see the enemy, like in John Wayne's movies. But you see soldiers explode into 1,000 pieces. And that's not like the John Wayne movie. Once you're there, you realize that what you were expecting is completely opposite to reality. What traumatized me the most throughout my stay in Vietnam is when I picked up Bobby Wilson's body. 
I first picked up an arm, then a leg, then the torso. I put everything in a poncho, and I took him in the helicopter. And you never get used to that. The GIs were prepared for a war that is similar to the one led by their fathers on the beaches of Normandy. But what awaits them in Vietnam has nothing to do with it. There is no front line. The enemy remains invisible. Face-to-face -face combat is rare, but the deaths and injuries are numerous. The American Army multiplies the operations of search and destroy in works that progressively undermine the morale of the Viet Cong and make them feel like they are being hunted down everywhere. All crops, buffaloes, chickens, and houses are being burned down in villages as per orders. We had suffered many losses in the regiment, with many deaths and injuries. In the Mylai region, we had been victims of snipers, traps, and bombs. We knew it was the Viet Cong. Mylai is located in the heart of a combat zone. It is one of the three hamlets of a village that the Vietnamese call Sun Mai. But it's more like Pinkville for the Americans because on staff maps, the area is colored in pink. Despite the war, life goes on. It's not just about search and destroy missions. GIs are also getting themselves the image of a benefactor. The regiments have been reunited, and the officers told us about the attacks of the coming days. There was a search and destroy mission, and we were going to attack first a battalion of the Northern Vietnam Army that was already in this region. It was going to be a hell of a fight. We were told that all the inhabitants were gone and all those who would stay would be the Viet Cong or their accomplices and that it had to be taken care of. We were also told that they had been warned of our arrival. We did it because we were going to avenge the soldiers we lost. We were finally going to really fight the enemy. It was one of the first real confrontations. We were geared up. I joined the Charlie Company on March 16, 1968, at 7.30 in the morning. I didn't know what to expect. As far as I knew, there was supposed to be a high number of Viet Cong in the village and I had to photograph that the encounter and the fight. It was supposed to be a normal operation. On March 16, 1968, Larry Colburn must protect soldiers on the ground from his helicopter. He flies to Mylai, where he has to help the Charlie Company. It's a regular mission. I do remember it was... On the morning of the mission, we were in the helicopter. 
I remember, it was a very sunny day. The sky was blue on the horizon. It was very hot. We could smell the plants and flowers that came out of the jungle. I remember that well. On the other hand, I did not hear much because of the helmet and the noise of the helicopter. But it was a very nice day. I think it was a Saturday. That day, we were having breakfast before going to the field, like every morning. A group of helicopters landed in the village over there. There were a lot of shootings right away. We didn't understand what was going on. We continued to eat. American soldiers have gathered and went into the house. At that point of the time, we were moving towards the village and we heard gunshots. We became nervous and tense. We didn't know exactly what we were getting into and what was going to happen to us. I was in the second helicopter that took off at 7.20 a.m. And when they dropped us off in the village, you could hear a lot of gunshots. Larry Colburn's helicopter soon flew over the Mylai area. People on the ground are confused. Small, scattered groups entered the village in multiple locations at the same time. Larry Colburn is surrounded by Glenn Andriata and Lieutenant Hugh Thompson, his supervisor who flies the helicopter. On the ground, among Charlie's officer's company, there was Lieutenant William Kelly and Captain Medina. Colonel Henderson, on the other hand, flies over the area. He's the leader of the 11th Infantry Brigade, to which Fred Widmer belongs. And once we got to the village, we saw women and children who had been killed. The Americans attacked the village. There was a terrible noise. Everyone was scared. People started to crawl and they stayed there. The Americans forced me to follow them. They told me to sit and I sat down. They told me to get up. I got up. They shoved me with their guns. I begged them to leave me, but they didn't understand what I was saying. They were very numerous, some continued to push us. We were scared. Normally, if we are told to move forward, we obey, but we are not afraid. That day, yes, we were really scared. They shot into the pagoda, and they pushed people around. It was terrible. At some point, they shot five people, to show what they could do. When they started shooting more, people were shouting, my God. They shot people, regardless of their age. The small ones like the big ones. Five years old, ten, seven, or eight. They did not stop to shoot. I was in an operation, so my photos had to illustrate the news dispatches and I had to use my black and white camera. But considering what was going on that day, I told myself that I couldn't only use my black and white camera. 
actually did happen. I chose to release my color camera, and I took photos that weren't intended to be published. Shot away at the things that would not be published. Most important images that I, I think the most terrible image that marked me is this group of people huddled, the others that got shot. I will never forget when I arrived and a soldier yelled, and there's someone with a camera. The soldiers turned around and looked at me. I watched them too. I took the photo and left. The other image that stuck with me is the pile of dead bodies that was on the road. I have a terrible memory of it. While I was getting ready to take photos of the bodies, a little boy who was injured in the arm came out of nowhere and got closer. It was like he was looking for his mother. At the same time, a GI kneeling next to me pointed his gun at him and killed him. The little boy was thrown onto the pile of dead bodies. I went back to the GI. I looked at him, and I asked him, why? The GI looked at me and left. We really looked at each other eye to eye. I remember my first shot. They flanked people by kicking them, they caught them by the hair. They pushed them to make them fall into the canal. It was terrifying. People were running and stumbled into the ditch. And once the people had fallen inside, they shot non-stop. They shot three times, four times with their machine guns. If they had only shot once, there'd maybe still be survivors. When you realize what you've done and it's bad, there's nothing we can do to stop. There is no going back. When we saw these injured civilians around the hamlet, we didn't know how it happened or who had injured them. So we marked them on the ground, hoping that the soldiers who were ashore would provide them with first aid. But instead, they were killing them. After the second shot, there was a quieter period. And then they shot for the third time. My dad was 70. He had a long beard. He was old. He was wearing a black suit. I wanted to tell him that I was still alive, but I was afraid of being discovered. If the Americans heard me, he would have killed me. They shot my dad in the head. At this moment, hundreds of people have already been massacred. Civilians were out because on that day, there was no Viet Cong in my life. But the mission goes on. No officer is stopping it. Lieutenant William Calley is massively killing civilians. Captain Medina lets go and is also fully involved in the mission. We had full trust in Captain Medina, who commanded the company. He did nothing to intentionally endanger us. He took care of his men. If he had asked us to follow him to hell, we would have done it. We would have done anything for him, and he would have done anything for us. When we saw Captain Medina kill a woman right in front of us, 
it became perfectly clear. It was our own soldiers who committed these atrocities. A woman we reported on the ground had a chest injury and she was waving as if she were asking for help. And he approached her. Medina, Medina walked up to her and looked at her. He threw a glance in our direction. We were about 10 meters away further, for two or three meters above the ground. And he looked at us again, kicked her and blew her away. That's when Thompson, our pilot, realized that he was going to have to intervene physically. Glenn Andriata, who was on the left in the helicopter, told us that he had just seen people in a bunker. We also noticed that there was an infantry troop that was moving in that direction. Thompson landed the helicopter between the people who were in the bunker and the infantry brigade who were arriving. And he went to the lieutenant of the brigade and told him that there were people in a bunker. And asked him how to get them out since they were civilians. And the lieutenant answered him that he would take them out with hand grenades. Thompson gave him an order. He said to him, you must keep your men in place, I have a better idea. It was very tense because the lieutenant obviously did not like that a young officer is giving him orders. But Mr. Thompson did. Then he came back to the helicopter and he told us, I'm going to get them out of this bunker myself. If these men open fire on me or on civilians while I get him out of the bunker, you fire. Then he signaled for people to get out gently. They started to trust him and they got out. We thought they were two or three, but in fact, there were almost ten of them, including this woman. To shoot our guys was the last thing I wanted to do. We loved these men. We were there to protect them. We were in a difficult position. I remember for a moment, I watched one of the soldiers. I waved my hand in a friendly way. And he answered me by waving at me as well. At that moment, I knew he wouldn't do anything to me. Thompson kept bringing out the Vietnamese. The guys sat down, they posed their bag, but it was too late. All the damage had been done. Pretty much all the damage had been done. So I got up. I removed the bodies that covered my son. I unstuck him, but he was unconscious. I tried to revive him. He started to breathe. I was so happy. I brought him home. When we got there, the buffaloes and the cows were dead and they had trashed the banana trees. They set the house on fire. I didn't know what to do anymore. I could not walk on the path because there were dead people everywhere. I had to cross the rice fields to go to the higher village. I brought my son back there. They asked me what had happened. That is my story. What a pity!
The Charlie Company stayed four hours in my lie. 504 people were murdered. After my lie happened, we just carried on to the next missions. And then Thompson and I made a report on what happened in my lie to the Colonel Anderson. We thought it was our duty to transmit this information to our hierarchy, because there was no doubt on the fact that these actions were reprehensible. The mission of the Charlie Company lasted for two more days. It is a failure. The Viet Cong wanted are in reality 40 kilometers away further west. When back to the camp, some are questioned by the commandment, but no one is worried. The officers decided to hide the case. New missions that are particularly dangerous were then handed over to the Charlie Company. Clearly, they were trying to bury us. They were hoping that we would fall into an ambush and we all get killed. That would have ended any kind of investigation. Meanwhile, in the United States, the Army takes care of the propaganda. fighting man of this war is the best trained soldier we have ever put into the field. As a total blackout on my lie, the army prefers to show, using small models, how they are helping Vietnamese peasants. A wind of revolt overflies the United States, even if the My Lai scandal did not explode yet. Anti-war movements are becoming more and more virulent. Campuses are on fire. In August 1968, the Democratic Convention opposes McCarthy, anti-war candidate, to Humphrey, vice president of Johnson. It is taking place in a very tense atmosphere. The face-to-face -face between the demonstrators and the police lasts for several days. The Republican Nixon will be elected president. The problem when we returned was the protesters. Some of my friends were with these protesters and think a soldier is worthless. They were spitting on us, pulling us down to the ground. When I got home, I wanted to make up for the lost time. And that's where I started using drugs and alcohol. When I came back from Vietnam, I've read things about all those GIs who were dying there or who were injured, and that made me mad. With all these anti-war protests, I thought that maybe people really needed to know what was going on there. I started doing films and I did small exhibitions about my two years in the army. I was showing the positive things that we did there, like when we brought medication to the villages, encounters with children and the villagers. We made them laugh. Afterwards, I showed my mission in my lie. These photos are worth absolutely nothing if you don't explain them. I wanted to know how people would react by explaining to them what had happened. Some thought I had invented everything, others that these photos were taken in Hollywood. Many told me that the GI couldn't do that, and that it was impossible because we were Americans. On April 2, 1969, a former GI, Ronald Reidenauer, writes a letter to several members of Congress in which he denounces the events of my lie that members of the Charlie Company told him.
After a preliminary investigation that confirms what Reidenauer had revealed, the Army confided to Andre Feyer, a military detective, the task of conducting a criminal investigation in the field. Very quickly, he wanted to meet Ron Heberl. He knew that every photographer, especially during missions, always had a personal camera and that a lot of soldiers in Vietnam were taking their own photos. That's how he contacted me and I collaborated with him. He asked if I had photos. I told him that I had some. I gave 17 photos to the Division of Criminal Investigations, the most important photos that teach us something on my life. You know, some photos are stronger than words, and others are better not talked about. The other photos showed terrible scenes of the actions. I destroyed those. Andre Fire soon decides to go to Vietnam. He takes with him a young soldier, Wayne Thorne, to help him gather testimonies. We were, stationed there in a little village called... we were stationed in a small town called Quang Nai. Witnesses and Vietnamese survivors from May Lai were brought there to question them. He didn't understand why we asked them questions about something so old related to war. There was so much people involved. It was not only a GI who shot another or a civilian. But it was a whole section that was involved in a true act of barbarity. People involved in what obviously turned into an act of mayhem. It was a sad day. It was a bad day. Excuse me. Something that is certain, I am relieved that my sons did not have to experience that. Those memories will always haunt me. Lieutenant Kelly was arrested in September 1969 and soon the press takes up the case. It is gaining momentum right away. Ron Heberl decides to make his photos public. At the end of November, Life magazine reveals the terrible images of the massacre. I knew that it was just the beginning, that there would be a trial, and people were going to be charged. I knew that the anti-war protests were going to be more and more important. Public opinion is calling for accountability. General Pierce is appointed to study the massacre and find out why the army tried to hide the truth. Civilians join his team, like Jerry Walsh, a New York lawyer. It was a great opportunity for a young lawyer like me to be involved in something like this. In December 1969, General Pierce goes to Vietnam. With his team, he wants to reconstruct the exact unfolding of events before determining responsibilities in the blackout that followed the massacre. On March 14, 1970, the report was finalized. Over 400 witnesses were interviewed. Over 80 soldiers are accused of murder. But the army decided to only prosecute those who are always wearing the uniform or Captain Medina and Lieutenant Kelly. While preparing his defense, William Kelly didn't forget to take care of his image in the press. If you want my opinion about why this happened, part of it was Lieutenant Kelly's very marginal... In my opinion, all of this have happened, partly because of the very limited skills of Lieutenant Kelly. It is necessary to remember that we were in 68 and that the army was really under pressure. Its workforce was three to four times more important than in the early 1960s. Under normal circumstances, Kelly would never have become an officer. But in this situation, he was able to become a lieutenant. 
He had absolutely no skills required. He was only 1 meter 65, which was the minimum required to be an officer in the American Army at that time. He had an IQ of 115, which was also the minimum. He only did two years of university, which also was the minimum. Unfortunately, everything was in place for a disaster like that could happen. Captain Medina, his company commander, Captain Medina was just a sergeant in the regular army, and the needs of the army gave him the opportunity to become an officer. Maybe he was a good sergeant, but he had no sense of judgment, nor the education that is expected of an officer. And Medina scared Cali. He treated him like an idiot. Which he was. When I was involved for the first time in the Mylai incident, I said several times that I did not order a massacre and that I didn't know that a massacre had taken place. Since the beginning of my involvement in the Mylai incident, I always followed the same line of conduct to tell the whole truth. I am a professional soldier, I am loyal to my country, and I have nothing to hide. The report of Piers undoubtedly concludes that the military hierarchy knew what had happened on March 16, 1968, at My Lai, and that they didn't say anything. Coster was in a helicopter, just above with Henderson, the battalion commander. The soldiers in the field sent reports every hour. At noon, in particular, a report states that they had killed 87 Viet Cong and recovered three weapons. General Piers was well aware when he read these two numbers that anyone who has a military experience in Vietnam would tell you that something weird happened. Because if 87 Viet Cong were killed, we should see 87 weapons or more. They never move without guns. In March 1971, after three months of trial, William Kelly awaits the verdict calmly. A large number of testimonies overwhelmed him during the debates. According to the testimony of a soldier, Kelly ordered to shoot with machine guns in the ditch to people. The soldier who was supposed to do it said that he couldn't Kelly answered him saying, get out. He did it himself. Although suspected of 80 murders, Lieutenant Kelly was only found guilty for 22 of them. He is sentenced to life in prison. A movement in favor of William Calley takes birth in public opinion. Many see him as a scapegoat. What do you think of the trial verdict? It stinks, sir. I don't think that he should have been convicted. War is war. I think that the soldiers that I had in Vietnam, those of the 11th Brigade, were well trained, very disciplined, and remarkably obedient to orders. They deserve my loyalty and will always deserve it. What are you going to do now, Colonel Henderson? I'm going home right away. I bought a Christmas tree last Monday, and I left it behind the house because I wasn't sure I could install it. I think that now, I'm going home, get in the Christmas spirit, and set up my tree. Between the 12 men designated by the survey for their role in the My Lai massacre, only six of them have faced trial. Five were acquitted, including Colonel Henderson. Only one was found guilty, Lieutenant William Kelly. Now for the Army, the case is closed. Even before the results.
Even before the result of the court-martial, during the trial itself, I had the impression that it was a masquerade, and it was something that was meant to calm American opinion. Because Life magazine blew up the case by showing to the public what happened that day, with the famous photos that are very shocking. For some strange reason, during the trial, I never thought that anyone could be held responsible. And my intuition proved to be true. But I think that the work that, that we did... In I think that our investigation was honest. It revealed the responsible. The work that the Army did in an attempt to punish criminals who carried out executions is something we can be proud of. But the result of our effort to prosecute these people was a fiasco. For the war in Vietnam. The President Nixon, who thinks go in the direction of its electorate, soon ordered the release of William Kelly. Under house arrest, he is awaiting an appeal judgment. On April 2, 1973, his life sentence is confirmed, but a year later the sentence is reduced to 10 years. The former lieutenant of Charlie Company is soon released on bail and can sell his testimony at strange conferences. One of the biggest tragedies for me, and for the men who were close to me, was the fact that we were conducting operations for a cause that we did not know. Morality and pain are there, but the frustration was that we had no idea why we were doing what we were doing. In 1998, 30 years after the massacre, the American government finally decides to honor the three soldiers who risked their lives to end the carnage. Hugh Thompson, the helicopter pilot who took responsibility to intervene, died in January 2006. Glenn Andriotta disappeared on a mission three weeks after the massacre. Larry Colborn is today the last survivor of this team who saved several Vietnamese that day. I will carry this burden until I die. I can't talk for the other soldiers, but it's such a strong guilt that it is impossible to get rid of. Once you've killed someone, you can't get rid of feelings of guilt. We are all guilty. I could forgive them. Only some Americans killed, not all of them. And in this group, not all of them participated. The recurring dream I've had over the years. There is a dream that I've been having for all these years. I am back at the ditch by myself. I try to help the victims, but they start pointing at me of the finger and accusing me of having committed these massacres. Accusing me of doing 
I try to explain to them that it's not me, that I am here to help them. But they don't listen to me and continue to accuse me. After 40 years, the feeling of loss and pain went away. Right after that, I was feeling hatred. I felt the lack. But now it's over. The pain has subsided. And then be sure you're standing tall. Oh, say can. 